Oh, this oh, is man, it? This is okay. it. I'll give it to you. Oh, when I, when I need it. Okay. Possiamo cominciare? Adesso il signore. Ah, ci abbiamo le te. Ok. You can, yeah, it's there, yes, yes. Bene, buongiorno a tutti. Benvenuti a questo incontro che interseca in modo evidente il tema del meeting di quest'anno, che mette a tema la natura dell'uomo, quel mistero che è l'uomo, che è Punto infinitesimo. We, a man as an infinitesimal dot in the universe, apparently marginal, and at the same time an essential point of everything that precedes man and surrounds him. At that level of nature which embodies the capacity for the infinite, yesterday Javier Prades is talk gave some indication of the profundity of this image of man. From a physical and biological standpoint, man can be seen as the destination, the point of arrival of an incredible, fantastic journey of the, in the entire history of the universe. It has taken 10 billion years to create the conditions in the universe, in one point in the universe, our planet, for life, the first organisms, to be able to survive. And after that, we, it took another three and a half, four billion years for these elementary forms of life to evolve into something increasingly large to then explode into what we call self-consciousness. Man is the last image in this history. In the last 100,000 years, but I think today we will learn that it is more, even more recent than that. The new reality of man emerged. What is man for which we can say the point at which before there was no man and at a certain point man appeared? And this is a crucial question which demands a current experience of what it means to be a human being, to be a truly human. So many questions arise from this topic. What being human truly means and scientifically what paleoanthropologists do when they track down the emergence of the human being. What is the role of language? the role of artistic expression in trying to track down signs of this new being. What role does the perception of the infinite and the religious sense have in this? And what is the state of our understanding in general of biological evolution? What are the open questions in this con connection? What relation is there between the datum of evolution with natural evidence and evolutionism as an ideological position. What relation is there between evolution and creation, man's being created and the creation of the universe? These are 
profound, important and fascinating topics that we shall tackle in the next two days in San Marino in a meeting. This is the sixth anniversary of the meeting in collaboration with the Rimini meeting with the Eurusis Association and the Republic of San Marino. A meeting will be held with 10 or so experts from different disciplines to tackle this topic. Today we have this meeting heralds that event and the title of the San Marino meeting, Biological Evolution and the Nature of Human Beings is the same title as today's meeting. The proceedings of the San Marino meeting will be published in El Ruiz's journal so that all of you will be able to read the proceedings online. Today we are about to hear the testimony of two key speakers who have been invited to San Marino and have also been invited to today's meeting and we are very grateful to them for agreeing to participate. William Carroll and Ian Tattersall. They are two leading figures, two leading scientific figures who have been investigating these topics from two different standpoints and this is important to realize that these major questions need to be tackled with different methods to be able to formulate an adequate answer to the questions raised. So here we have a leading paleo anthropologist Ian Tattersall who is the uh, curator emeritus of the Division of Anthropology of the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He studied in Cambridge and in Yale and is one of the world's leading experts in human fossils and their role in evolution. Ian has led a number of scientific expeditions to different areas of the world, including Madagascar, Vietnam, Suriname, and Mauritius. He's the author of more than 100 scientific publications, in particular, a treaty on homid fossil record, which is a, a milestone in his field. Ian is also a leading promoter of paleoanthropological studies for the public at large and has written many well-known books accessible to all and he has also created different exhibitions at the Natural History Museum in New York including the Hall of Human Origins, a permanent exhibition which you will be able to see if you are lucky enough to visit New York. So I'd like to thank Ian for participating today at this meeting. Let me also introduce Bill Carroll. Bill is Thomas Aquinas Fellow in Theology and Science at the Blackfriars Faculty of Theology, the University of Oxford. He is also a member of the Faculty of Theology at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on the history of science, in particular the reception of Aristotelian science in the Middle Ages in Judaism and the Christian world. He has also studied the relations of Galileo at, with the ecclesiastical authorities and has made original contributions to the doctrine of creation and the relation between the natural sciences, especially biology and cosmology, and philosophy and theology. He has been visiting professor in many universities in the United States, South America and Europe. He has taught at the Royal Society and at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. As on the topic of Thomas Aquinas on creation and the topics or topical topics of Thomas Aquinas and the world of sciences. I am very grateful to them for 
in preparing for this meeting, we were already establishing the type of relationship which makes friendship a new thing at this meeting, uh, a meeting of minds focusing on truth. I'm allowing 20 minutes to each speaker, first Ian Tattersall and then Bill Carroll, and then there will be time for questions after their talk. Thank you very much. Well, buongiorno a tutti, and thank you, uh, Professor Bersanelli, for that extremely uh, kind uh, introduction. And please let me start by apologizing uh, for not being able to speak to you directly in uh, your own beautiful language. Uh, but we have great translators, so I know it will all be fine. And it really is a great pleasure to be speaking to you at this wonderful meeting. It really is unlike any meeting I have ever attended. And uh, there's a really great feeling to it. Well, the question at issue in uh, this year's meeting is the relation of uh, humankind to the uh, infinite. And that's not the sort of subject that I, as a, a working paleontologist, normally uh, think about from day to day. So let me first of all sort of introduce myself a bit more as a preamble to our upcoming uh, discussion. Um, I'm a paleoanthropologist. That is to say, I specialize in the uh, study of the fossils that document the long story of human evolution. And the fossils themselves don't have a lot to say directly themselves uh, about the infinite or even about our capacity to uh, perceive uh, the infinite. And of course, as you all know, fossils are the uh, petrified remains, mainly the bones and the teeth, are the hard tissues of animals that lived and died a very long time ago. And while these, uh, here we go, while these tangible fossils tell us a lot about how their owners moved and fed when they were alive, they tell us next to nothing about how these creatures had perceived and apprehended the world around them. Even fossilized brains like these that we see here, or more properly, um, casts of the inside of ancient brain cases, really don't say a lot directly about any of the questions we're addressing. But we do know, of course, and from pretty good fossil evidence, uh, that over the past two million years, the brains of our ancient precursors enlarged pretty steadily as time went on. And we see that pretty clearly in this chart of human brain sizes or hominid brain sizes plotted against time. But I do not want you to take this rather simplistic chart as implying that our unusual kind of intelligence, the intelligence we have today, was acquired sort of as a result of a steady progression over time in a single lineage, as certainly I was taught many years ago. Instead, as you can see, in this genealogical tree of our hominid family, we became the creatures that we are as the result of a grand process of evolutionary trial and error over a period of some seven million years. And this long process involved many different species, each one of them experimenting uh, with the hominid potential in its own way. And our species Homo sapiens today is, as an ever-increasing fossil record is making ever more apparent, we are only one branch, one terminal branch at the tip of a luxuriously branching bush. Now, the fact that we are the only survivors the, uh, of this uh, process of experimentation, the only hominid alive today, tells us a great deal about ourselves. But what it does not tell us is that we are the products of a steady process 
of improvement. Of course, the large brain size we see in the extinct hominids at the top of this evolutionary bush here are a pretty good indicator that most of our precursors were in some way becoming smarter over this long time period. But unfortunately, we still don't know exactly how any of these ancient hominids processed information in their minds. And we cannot know from their physical remains just how they subjectively experienced the world or in which they lived or how they viewed their place in that world. But happily, we do have in the hominid case an additional source of information, which is to say the archaeological record. Now, the archaeological record is the archive of ancient human behaviors as reflected in the artifacts that our ancient precursors made. Uh, like this early stone flake that we see in this slides. And also we have evidence in the nature of the living sites that they left behind them and at which such artifacts are often found. And indicators like this allow us to seek some insight into how our unusual way of mentally dealing with information arose. And this is important because our style of processing information in our brains appears to be truly unique in the uh, living world. Uniquely among living creatures, we human beings are able to disassemble our surroundings in our minds into a huge vocabulary of mental symbols. And then we can recombine these symbols according to certain rules to create, to produce alternative notions of the world around us and to envisage new possibilities about that world. And the result of all this is that we live significantly in the world as we reconstruct it in our heads rather than in the world as nature presents it ob ob itself objectively to us. And this unique capacity shows in every aspect of our lives. Other species react uh, more or less directly and with greater or le lesser sophistication to the stimuli that impinge on them from the outside world. But our symbolic capacity allows us human beings to envision alternatives and to ask ourselves questions such as, what if? And as a result, we're not doing what other creatures do, only a little bit better or a lot better. We are dealing with information in an entirely distinctive way. And it's this symbolic faculty of ours that allows us to conceive of the infinite and of other abstract qualities and entities that we can't see or hear or touch. Now, perhaps there's no better way of uh, to gauging the extent of this unique ability of ours than by looking at the cognitive style of our closest living relatives, the great apes. And numerous, suggest, uh, numerous observations suggest that cognitively, the apes are very complex creatures indeed. But although hardly a week passes in which one or another ape is not reported to do something that we once thought only we did, for example, using a hammer and an anvil to crack a hard nut, as we see here, the cognitive gulf uh, between us still looms very large indeed. Because sophisticated as they undoubtedly are, the living great apes are not uh, symbolic. And there's good reason to believe that cognitively, today's great apes broadly resemble our earliest hominid ancestors that lived some seven million years ago, just after our lineage had separated from that, uh, leading to uh, chimpanzees today. Now, those ancient precursors almost certainly had no idea of the infinite, 
and they were unable to uh, conceive of a creator or indeed to conceive of any non-material entity. Yet today, seven million years later, we do have that ability. And indeed, it's an ability that is of paramount importance in our daily lives. It is what makes us truly different from anything else out there. So we have to ask ourselves, when was that threshold crossed? When and how did our precursors become cognitively modern humans, qualitatively distinct in this respect from all other organisms on Earth, and able to envisage the infinite of which we can feel part? Well, that's where that archaeological record comes in. And the answers it gives us are perhaps a little surprising. But let's start at the beginning, even before uh, there was an archaeological record. Now, the very first ancient human precursors we know of, such as this one here from Chad in central West Africa, had ape-like skulls with small brains and big faces and were probably no smarter than apes are today. But although they lived in a habitat with lots of trees and had long arms and short legs, creatures like this, and we see a representation here, are thought to have walked upright when they were on the ground, unlike apes, which move around terrestrially on all fours. Well, this basic description I've just given you fits all hominids up to about two million years ago. And yet, at some point, those archaically proportioned uh, creatures began to behave differently from apes. By about three and a half million years ago, they'd begun to use naturally sharp pieces of stone fractured in riverbeds to butcher animal carcasses. And at the same time, their diet was broadening to include a much wider range of foods than the fruits and the flowers and the leaves that were the main food resources of apes. And by about, by about two and a half million years ago, our precursors had begun actually to make sh sharp flakes like this one themselves. They'd begun to manufacture sharp flakes. And they began to spend much more time in more open habitats, doing things that uh, you wouldn't expect to see an ape doing as we see represented in this painting. Still, by uh, not much after two million years ago, we begin to pick up evidence of a radically new kind of hominid, uh, like this one that we see here, with a much more modern looking body, more modern body proportions, although it still had only a modest sized brain. But even with this new kind of hominid on the scene, simple flake tools like the one you just saw continued to be made. To, um, <clears throat> only about half a million years later did tools like this one, we see here, oops, there we go, this one with much more um, uh, made to a specific shape begin to be manufactured. And this set a pattern of disconnection between biological and technological innovation in human evolution that is important in understanding the transition uh, to modern cognitive status. But I emphasize that even tools like this hand axe, though it's sophisticated and complicated to manufacture, do not suggest that hominids were thinking in our symbolic manner. And even when this yet more advanced uh, kind of hominid came along called Homo heidelbergensis, at about 600,000 years ago, we still have no evidence that symbolic minds were at work, that symbolic objects were being made. And this remained true even for the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, who appeared in Europe uh, about 200,000 years old uh, ago. Uh, Italy has a fabulous record of these creatures, 
and who had brains as big as ours are. As you can see from the Neanderthal on the left here and the modern human on the right, the Neanderthals were anatomically quite different from us. And while they were definitely smart and resourceful and they had quite uh, made quite sophisticated stone tools like the ones you see here, the Neanderthals left no evidence that they were manipulating information in their minds in the way that we do. Even more surprising, this was also true of the first anatomically recognizable Homo sapiens, like the ones we see, one we see here, and fossils like this start to show up in Africa at about 200,000 years ago. As far as we can tell, from the rather scanty archaeological record these forms left us, these early Homo sapiens left us, they were behaving more or less like Neanderthals, and not at all in the kind of uh, typical modern way that we do. And it was not until much later, at about 100,000 years ago, that members of our species started to behave in a radically new way, as suggested by such things as, uh, as little snail shells uh, pierced for body ornamentation, um, as we see here. But not long after that, they were producing, already producing overtly symbolic objects, such as this geometrically engraved stone plaque from the site of Blombos in South Africa. It's about 80,000 years old, and at last, human beings were clearly behaving in a radically new and unprecedented manner, and one that was clearly underwritten by symbolic cognitive processes. And this trend was, of course, fully realized by the time the great tradition of uh, cave art began in Europe at about 40,000 years ago. And ever since, the archaeological record has borne a signal of incessant change and the pursuit of the new. In stark contrast to this pattern we've seen of very sporadic innovation that had gone before. Now, all of these innovations depended on the switch to the symbolic cognitive style. And this transition, which witnessed the birth of our ability to create abstractions in the mind and to envisage and thus to experience the infinite clearly took uh, place well within the tenure of Homo sapiens on Earth. So, again, we ask ourselves, what happened? Well, to cut a very long story short, it is likely that at the origin of our species Homo sapiens as an anatomically recognizable entity some 200,000 years ago, a small addition or alteration to the pre-existing brain was acquired that made symbolic thought possible. And this cerebral innovation was evidently built on the foundations provided by several hundred million years of vertebrate evolution. But it did not simply produce an incremental improvement on what was there before. What was almost certainly a minor mutation at the genetic level, the genomic level, had produced a structure with a radically new potential. But that potential lay fallow, it lay unused, until it was finally released by what must have been a cultural stimulus. And this would actually have been a pretty uh, routine event in uh, evolutionary terms. Now, I'd like to suggest that the stimulus concerned was probably the spontaneous invention of language within a small population of Homo sapiens somewhere in Africa and around 100,000 years ago. And this is because, just as human thought does, 
language involves the creation and the manipulation of symbols in the mind. And indeed, thought as we experience it is virtually inconceivable in the absence of language. Of course, almost equally inconceivable is the very transition itself from non-symbolic to symbolic thought. But we know that Homo sapiens is descended at some remove from a non-symbolic form. So however improbable it might ever have been that this transition would occur, we know it indeed happened. But this is as far as science will take us at present. I think we can pretty confidently say that it was with the acquisition of the symbolic capacity that humankind's ability to relate to the infinite and to feel itself part of the infinite uh, began. And I think we can also say that this acquisition was very recent and was achieved in a single event rather than by gradual refinement over the eons, which implies our species has not been fine-tuned for anything. So this provides the scientific framework within which we have to understand the emergence of human consciousness and our parallel ability to conceptualize the infinite, which now affects every aspect of our daily lives. But this is just the immediate context. Any wider metaphysical perspective within which this extraordinary emergent event is to be understood is more properly furnished by philosophers and by theologians and by students of human thought, such as my colleague Bill Carroll, who will speak next. And thank you very much for your attention. First slide, please. No, no. Okay. Ecco. Perfetto. <laughs> no, prego. Oh, okay. Vai, vai pure. Buongiorno. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers of the Rimini meeting, in particular, Professor Marco Bersanelli and Maddalena Giungi and the other volunteers. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to be here today. I'll just say a few words in, in the language of Dante and then I will talk in English. One day in Rimini, a little boy asked his mother where he came from. His mother, pleased to have the opportunity to discuss such an important matter with her son, began by offering an elementary account of human biology, introducing references to the theory of evolution. Rather than restrict her analysis to the realm of the purely physical, she spoke of God's role in the creation of each human soul and ultimately of God as creator, as the source of all that exists. After his mother had finished, her young son looked somewhat confused and said to her that he had, he had wondered where he'd come from because his friend 
in the neighborhood had said that he came from America. This anecdote shows us how difficult it is to distinguish between the different kinds of origins. A, difficult, a, a difficulty that is evident in many debates concerning philosophical and theological implications of evolutionary biology. Now, I'm afraid I must change language and I will continue my talk in English. For say it will plows a wound in and teach you pop up. Stories of origins go to the heart of every culture. And investigations of the nature and origins of life concern various scientific, philosophical, and theological disciplines. Although any discussion of evolution and creation, for example, requires knowledge from each of these three areas, it is not always to keep these disciplines distinct. To know, for example, what is the appropriate competence of each field of inquiry. Nor is it always easy to remember that a truly adequate view of life and its origins requires the insights of all three. <clears throat> Making distinctions about origins is key to my own teaching and writing. This is especially the case as I wrestle with the relationship between the doctrine of creation understood in philosophy and theology and the appropriate domains of discourse of the natural sciences. In these brief remarks, I want to give you a sense of what I do and in the process to raise claims which many of you might find provocative. My claim is that to know what it means to be human, indeed what it means to be anything, is fundamentally to recognize what it means to be created. That is, to depend continually and completely upon God's creative act. Such a recognition is not easy, since discussions about biology and human nature often become obscured in broader political, social, and philosophical contexts. Indeed, evolution and creation have taken on cultural connotations, serve as ideological markers, with the result that each has come to stand for a competing worldview. Creationism, and what we might call evolutionism, have come to represent rival religious views of the world, rival stories of origins, rival judgments about the meaning of human life, rival sets of moral dictates. Evolutionism is a collection of cultural claims which have their roots in, but ought to be distinguished from, the scientific discipline of evolutionary biology. Similarly, too often creation is confused with various forms of creationism, which embrace either a literalistic reading of the Bible or think that to create must mean a kind of divine intervention in cosmic history with God's directly creating each individual species of living things. Often today, the choice seems to be between a purely natural explanation of the origin and development of life, an explanation in terms of common descent, genetic mutations, and natural selection as the mechanism of biological change <coughs> on the one hand, and on the other, an explanation which sees divine agency as the direct source of life 
in all its diversity, and that human beings, created in the image and likeness of God, have a special place in the universe. What is at issue in current debates is not some naive view that the Earth is only <clears throat> 10,000 years old or that God created it in six days. Rather, for many believers, however old the world is, God is necessary to explain the order and design evident in it. It is precisely such an understanding of creation that many people think evolution denies. Not only does natural selection replace divine agency, but chance supplants order and design in explanations of the origin of life. The difference appears stark, either Darwin or God. <coughs> the sense of fundamental incompatibility between creation and evolution is part of a wider intellectual framework in which scientific developments have been used to support a kind of totalizing naturalism. This is the view that the universe and the processes within it need no explanation beyond the categories of the natural sciences. The argument is that contemporary science is fully sufficient, at least in principle, to account for all that needs to be accounted for in the universe. Whether we speak of explanations of the Big Bang itself, such as quantum tunneling from nothing, or of some version of a multiverse hypothesis, or of self-organizing principles in biological change, including appeals to randomness and chance, the conclusion which seems inescapable to many is that there is no need to appeal to a creator that is, to any cause which is outside the natural order. In such a scenario, the natural sciences, especially biology, tell us all we need to know about what a human being is. On the contrary, one fundamental claim I wish to make is that it is not possible to have an adequate understanding of what it means to be human unless we bring together knowledge from biology, philosophy, and theology. Oh, okay. Va <laughs> bene. <laughs> oh, pet, pet in crazy. Uh, attention. That, uh, the, the argument is that contemporary science is uh, uh, in such a scenario, the natural sciences, especially biology, tell us all we need to know. I think that we can affirm both a robust notion of God as the cause of all that is, and the importance of biology in helping us to understand what it means to be human. We need not choose one over the other. Here, I want to use the insights of Thomas Aquinas, who, although living in the 13th century, has much to tell us about the relation between God's act of creating and science. Such an appeal to Thomas might seem strange, but I think Thomas provides the analytical tools needed to disentangle much of contemporary confusion about evolutionary biology and creation. In particular, there are three fundamental insights of Thomas which are especially relevant. First, his understanding of creation as an explanation of origin in a metaphysical and theological sense, so that God's creative act is the continuing cause of the complete existence of all that is as it is. Second, his understanding of how God's causality functions in a radically different way from the kind of causality exercised by creatures, both animate and inanimate, so that there is no competition, no conflict between God's causality 
including his providential ordering of all that is, and the kinds of causality which the natural sciences discover in the world. And third, that nature does disclose an intrinsic finality, but such disclosure is found in the discipline of natural philosophy and is not inconsistent with chance and randomness in nature. A brief comment now about each. First, creation as a metaphysical and theological notion affirms that all that is, in whatever way or ways it is, depends upon God as cause. The natural sciences have as their subject the world of changing things, from subatomic particles to human life to galaxies. Whenever there is a change, there must be something that changes. Whether these changes are biological or cosmological, without beginning or end, or temporally finite, they remain processes. To create, on the other hand, is to be the radical cause of the whole existence of whatever exists. Creation is not a change. To cause completely something to exist is not to produce a change in something, is not to work on or with some existing material. Creation is not primarily some distant event. Rather, it is the ongoing, complete causing of the existence of all that is. At this very moment, were God not causing all that is to exist, there would be nothing at all. Evolutionary biology and all the other natural sciences offer accounts of change. They do not address the metaphysical and theological questions of creation. They do not speak to why there is something rather than nothing. No discovery in biology can challenge the fact that human beings are created. Second, as creator, God causes creatures to exist in such a way they are, that they are the real causes of their own operations. For Thomas, God is at work in every operation of nature. But the autonomy of nature is not an indication of some reduction in God's power or activity. Rather, it is an indication of his goodness. It is important to recognize that divine causality and creaturely causality function at fundamentally different levels. God and natural causes are not in competition with one another. God causes all natural processes to be what they are and to have an autonomy of their own. Biological explanations of human origins do not challenge the truth that human beings are created by God. There are two different senses of origin here. Whatever biological processes there are, God is their cause, and he causes these processes to have their own integrity. Third, for Thomas Aquinas, the question of finality and purpose in nature does not involve a powerful, intelligent designer who moves pieces of reality across a cosmic chessboard. In causing things to be, God causes them to have their own intrinsic principles of characteristic behavior, a kind of intrinsic directedness. If there were no end-directed or end-seeking behavior in physical reality, there would be no regularities, functions, or structures about which we could formulate laws of nature, and thus there would be no science of nature. However frequent chance events are in biological evolution, 
and however much as a result the actual course of evolution is indeterminate and thus unpredictable, it is a mistake to elevate pure chance to an ultimate explanatory principle. Chance events occur within nature, within the context of a reality susceptible to rational investigation because it is intelligible. God accomplishes his purposes in and through the universe he has created. Science discloses the way the universe operates in terms of principles in the universe. God so transcends the created order that he can be the cause of all that is without compromising the causal efficacy of creatures, so too his purpose issues from the same transcendence beyond the categories of time, place, and change. Concludo adesso in... I'd like to end by speaking in Italian. Just a short pause. You might be surprised that God's creative act can be such a vast topic in philosophy alone. Thomas Aquinas certainly, saw, th certainly thought so. You will note that I have not addressed exclusively theological questions concerning biblical accounts of origins. But in this regard, I should mention that Thomas tells us that what is essential to faith in the Genesis account is the fact of creation, not the manner or mode of formation of the world and of living things. Evolutionary biology is focused on the latter topics, not what it means to be created. Each of the three themes I have spoken of involves deep questions in philosophy and theology and obviously requires more explanation than I can give in these remarks. I hope in any case that I have offered a flavor with some substance of the kind of work I do at Oxford and how that work is important for providing a variety of answers to questions such as where do we come from and how did we get here? We can ans by answer by appealing both to the natural sciences and to God. Thank you very much for your attention. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Ian, for your talks. I could go on with this dialogue forever. We'll have a chance in the next two days to continue. But as we have a little bit of time, I wanted to ask each of them a question to go back to some of the issues they mentioned. I'd like to start with Ian because his fascinating talk showed us, talked about the emergence, an almost sudden emergence of man with respect to what was thought up to date. I'd like to ask which what is the discovery that you would most like to make in paleoanthropology? The discovery which would shed more light, for example, I think of a question, how far is it possible to hope to identify an event, a single a special event, when language emerged, for example? What are the possibilities we have to identify this, this sudden um, 
appearance of a self-aware man. What have you to say about the nature of human beings? To, uh, to uh, deal with in uh, just a moment or, t or two. Uh, but let me answer first about what discoveries would I like most to go out into, uh, into the field and uh, make. Um, my, there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge of the human fossil record. It's actually much better than most of us usually suppose. There's an awful lot known about the human uh, biological past. But one thing that we do not know very much about in terms of tangible evidence is the origin of our own species as an anatomical entity. I showed a couple of, uh, uh, one slide of, of one specimen from um, Africa that may be about 200,000 years old. Uh, but as you saw, it was a pretty fragmentary piece. And it's really important for us to know more about the, the, the tangible evidence for the emergence of Homo sapiens because Homo sapiens is an unusually different kind of uh, species. Uh, we know the Neanderthals were part of a larger group. There are fossils in the record that look somewhat like Neanderthals, but not completely like Neanderthals. There's nothing in the record that looks convincingly like an intermediate between Homo sapiens and anything else. And this leads us to suppose that the origin of our group as an anatomical entity lay in some kind of event of genetic regulation, a change in gene regulation that had developmental consequences all through the body from top to bottom. And that's where we uh, probably got the brain that was capable of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of symbolic uh, manipulations. But we don't have any fossil evidence, or we have very poor fossil evidence poorly, uh, that, that, uh, that really um, helps us to understand uh, the nature and the context of this event. So if there's one thing I'd like to go out in the, in the field and find, it is evidence of this kind because it would allow us to place the emergence of our own cognitive system, which is what distinguishes us so much, in a much better context than we have right now. And I think all of the things that we uh, prize ourselves for being and all of the things that make us different from everything else are basically um, consequences of this change in information processing in the mind. And it's very important to know more about that. And now I would like to ask Bill. He presented an overview of how creation differs from what we often hear discussed with some passion that the creator is the ongoing God is the creator of everything, not simply filling in the gaps that science has left open. And it seems to me that these two different images of God the Creator from a theological point of view are very different. The idea of God intervening to fill the gaps that our rational explanation cannot, cannot fill 
satisfactorily and God the father and creator of everything and the prime mover of everything that exists what I wanted to ask you was what makes this set this second image of God more credible than the first the simple answer to the second part of the question what makes this more credible is because it is true <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> well, I, for, perhaps I am speaking only to the choir here. <laughs> uh, 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 the important point to keep in mind, at least in the tradition of uh, theological and philosophical reflection that informed Midi Islam and Juda Judaism and Christianity in particular in the Middle Ages, and I think in, to today as well, is to recognize that creation is not an initial event. In fact, creation is not an event at all. Creation is a relationship of complete dependency of whatever is in whatever way it is upon God as cause. To speak, as some do, of a God of the gaps, of a God who gives us explanations of natural processes which the natural sciences are as yet unable to provide, such a view is a very limited view of God. It makes God a kind of superpower a kind of cause just more powerful than natural causes. Such a view of God is hardly the view of the God of Muslim and Jewish and Christian revelation. So for theological reasons alone, one ought to reject this notion of a God of the gaps because it's a false God. It's a kind of idol, a simply superpower. In a way, God is not more powerful than creatures. God is other powerful. Huh? Uh, so when we talk about the, uh, God's causality, we have to recognize that we are speaking in very different terms and that for theological reasons, we should reject this notion of God sort of filling in the gaps. But we also, for philosophical reasons, need to reject it. The argument that Thomas Aquinas and people like Avicenna, for example, and Maimonides in the Middle Ages, their arguments of God, for God in the, in the realm of metaphysics, as well as in the realm of theology, their, realm of, their arguments for God in metaphysics are God as this complete, ongoing, continuing cause of the whole reality of things. So, the question of God as complete cause, not the God of the gaps, is an especially good meeting for both reason and faith. Faith dis discloses that God is not the God of the gaps, that God is the complete ongoing cause of all that is, and metaphysics. Reason alone also helps us to see this. One of the most radical sentences in the 13th century was written by Thomas Aquinas, and it remains true. And he said, not only does faith reveal that there is a creator, but reason also demonstrates it. So Thomas thought that on the question of creation, we have a marvelous synthesis, a marvelous coming together of the truths of reason and faith. Obviously, faith adds much more to our knowledge of the Creator than reason alone does. But here, both metaphysics and theology help us to see that the notion of God of the gaps, the notion of God as an intelligent designer, such notions are truly impoverished, impoverished from the point of view of reason and impoverished from the point of view of faith.
I would just like to ask both speakers to comment so that we've created a dialogue between two scholars who look at reality from different methodological approaches. And this dialogue is crucial. This is what Benedict the Sixteenth called for, including his message to this meeting, calling for dialogue. And I think that this aspect of looking beyond the method of that each scholar uses in his research gradually is starting to penetrate the scientific community and to make headway. It's starting to be recognized that science alone is not sufficient because it does not have the capacity to answer certain questions even though science remains uh, self-celebratory, closed in its little world, as it were, in its presumed superiority. But this need to consider certain questions from different standpoints in relation to theology and to philosophy is starting to make some headway. On the other hand, a certain idea of interdisciplinarity risks being an abstract concept of putting parts together without a synthesis. So I wanted to ask both speakers, how do you think that the great questions that we have tackled in this meeting about the nature of man, how can, what help can we gain to move towards a true understanding which is not partial or ideological, each person making their own contribution. Gosh, that's another uh, very uh, big question. But there is no doubt that the, the scientific picture of ourselves and of our place in the world and of the kind of creature we are uh, the scientific picture is only part of a larger picture. Um, I do think that the, what science can uh, contribute to this understanding of the larger picture is sort of compartmentalized because of the kind of knowledge that science gives us. You know, um, science is often taught as a kind of an authoritarian uh, system of uh, knowledge, dealing, uh, dishing out absolutes that have been proven by scientific methodologies. This actually is not true, and it's a very bad thing that science is often taught um, in this way, uh, in, my, in, in my view. Science is a provisional system of knowledge, and scientific knowledge is always changing. Of course, there's a central core of knowledge that is very unlikely uh, to be changed in the future. But science really is a process rather than uh, a product. It's a process of questioning um, about the world. And it has its limitations. And we need to recognize those limitations and we need to know the limits at which we can move on to other levels of explanation of phenomena, such as Professor Bersinelli was talking about, the, the emergent nature of, of humans that really need to be answered if we're ever going to have a full uh, integrated account of ourselves and our place in greater things. I think I would make uh, three points in response concerning the question of the need for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary investigations of these questions. I am reminded of the wonderful insight of Jacques Maritain of the last century, whose 
a famous phrase of the need to distinguish in order to unite. And Maritain argues that we have to be careful to keep distinct our different disciplines, our different areas of investigation, each with their own appropriate methodology, their own appropriate first principles. But the reason that we keep these disciplines distinct is so that the unity of knowledge which we can achieve from these various disciplines is an appropriate unity, a unity of clarity and not confusion. So we must distinguish in order to unite. Furthermore, my second point is that there is no good metaphysics or theology without good natural science. A metaphysician or a theologian who is ignorant of the natural sciences proceeds in barren abstractions, disconnected really from reality. So metaphysics and theology require the insights of the natural sciences. Similarly, the natural sciences need, as Professor Tattersall remarked, needs to, need to be aware of the appropriate limits as well as the richness and profundity of their disciplines. And my third point is the following. Intellectual disciplines, biology, metaphysics, theology, are all habits. They're habits of the mind. And one person can possess more than one habit. However, one needs to be careful. I play tennis and I brush my teeth in the morning. When I hit a backhand in tennis, I have a habit, a disposition I know to turn my wrist and to bend my knees appropriately and so forth. I don't think about it. When I brush my teeth in the morning, I don't think about how I'm doing it. I possess both habits. It, of course, would be a huge mistake to try to brush my teeth with my tennis racket. <laughs> and that is the danger of some forms of false confluence of disciplines. We can have these diverse habits, but we need to understand each proper, it's its proper role. Grazie. Credo sia stato davvero un contributo. Thank you. I think we have heard exceptional contributions from Ian and Bill today. And the evidence that Ian has showed us of a cognitive qualitative leap talking about the emergence of that level which can only be called human a discontinuity scientifically evident in this emergence and it is amazing how he identified this as marked by a symbolic capacity of recognizing a meaning the ability to acknowledge that reality signifies something else and this is the trace of the human being. This is the start of the word human, of human desire. Mysteriously, this came to pass. And Bill told us how knowledge means knowing how to be human beings. It also signifies acknowledging that we have been created that we are not made by ourselves or from ourselves, but that we depend totally on a mystery which is responsible for every star, every flower, any, every instant, every person in the universe. So let me conclude with some of the many observations that Don Giussani gave us to make us realize the vertigo that the self in the cosmos and the level of 
human beings in nature, he said that the cosmos reaches its peak in self-awareness, self-consciousness. Awareness of self in nature is God. Each one of us has our self-awareness of the cosmos. So if the self is the self-awareness of the cosmos, then everything, the relationship with the creator, with the infinite, with what cannot be measured, the origin and the destiny of everything, is played out in the self, in the consciousness and awareness one has of the self. If the self, Don Giussani said, is the self-awareness of the cosmos, then the worst crime the self can commit is not to know himself. Instead, he must be aware of himself. As Jesus said, what does it matter to man to gain the, the world, the entire world, if he loses himself? Thank you, and thank you, special thanks to our speakers.